All right, so hello everybody, my name is Josef and today I will talk about the Sculpt.OS. Well, actually, since you can see at the, from the title of my talk, which is called Exploring Sculpt.OS, um, I will not only talk about the system, but I will also um, show you the system, actually. So, oh, I've structured my talks in basically far, oh, well, the old slides, well, I will manage. Uh, um, four parts, basically I will just start with giving you some background information about the um, underlying uh, technology that is used, namely the Gnode.js framework to build the Sculpt.js. Um, then I will give you a brief overview uh, of the Sculpt system itself followed by how you can extend the system by basically installing software on the running system. And um, well, we skip the fourth um, point and we'll go straight to the, the roadmap. So there are some things we still have planned for this year. And all right. So let me start by giving you some background information. Um, uh, well, actually, uh, I, I just have to, to use, still use the, the other slides because it's, uh, well, that will be a little bit complicated. Uh, I just have to, to look for the, the proper slides, otherwise I will get confused. Uh, which no will be bad. Ah well, I, it's it doesn't matter. Um, so let's just move on. Well, um, the the. Well, the problem is that we, by now, we are surrounded by an uh, increasing number of computing devices, and those computing devices uh, mostly, or by now, are running commodity operating systems, which are highly complex. Um, and since the vendors mostly want to innovate quickly, they accept the reliance on such highly complex systems. But um, well, on the other hand, um, the key ingredients or the technologies or principles uh, th that can be used to build still complex systems but uh, whose complexity can be better managed are available but are not employed. And um, from within the L4 microkernel research community um, came the idea to explore the pra uh, practicality of a component-based operating system that uses capabilities to manage the complexity, the overall complexity of a um, commodity, contemporary commodity system in a better way. So the first idea um, well, came in, in back in 2003. And it took some time, but eventually in 2006, the first prototype was built with some success. In fact, so much success that the um, people behind the prototype decided to found a company to develop the prototype even further back in 2008. And that is, is basically how the um, whole project got started. So, if we talk about the complexity of uh, contemporary commodity systems, how can you structure or provide a new system uh, structure if you disregard all the assumptions that are normally made when you uh, build a traditional operating system? What are the key features that such a system architecture should provide? Well, as I said, the um, uh, commodity systems normally consist of a, um, a complex global system policy um, where it's difficult to have fine-grained control over the uh, different components within the system. So what we would like to have in a new clean state uh, system architecture would be um, an, an architecture that follows the principle of least privilege, where um, each component um, only has uh, the access rights and or access to the resources that are needed for the component to fulfill its function. 
and we want to have a mechanism where we can express uh, exactly this, this uh, property, which basically lead us, leads us to capability-based security. Another point is um, that we have mixed criticality. criticality. That means that we have complex components that we don't fully trust and we have um, security sensitive functions we also want to uh, run on the system and we want to run them on the same system at the same time without um, that the untrusted components can influence the um, security critical functions. So we can achieve that by isolating, strictly isolating each component and uh, structuring the, way, uh, the system in a way that we can assess the application-specific trusted computing base. Well, uh, application-specific trusted computing basic, uh, base is basically the uh, amount of code a component or a program or a user of a program um, has to trust in order for the program to fulfill its purpose, um, with, which in commodity um, commodity systems can be quite large. Another thing is that we want to have a robust uh, system. Um, by now, almost all operating systems provide the illusion that all resources are infinite. And they go to great length to um, well, uphold this illusion. Like, for example, um, if memory becomes scarce, they try to, to uh, swap out inactive processes to make room for, for active processes and apply some heuristics and eventually if something fails or the, the whole construct falls down in the worst case, um, the OS kernel normally chooses arbitrarily some process that it will kill to free up resources for other processes. And we don't actually want that in our new system. And um, we actually don't want to have the abstraction of resources at all. So what we want to have is the uh, ability to um, remove the abstractions, only trade physical resources, but in a way that we can account them, that we can trade them, and that we can track them. Um, trading them is vital to this concept because um, since the physical resources are finite, um, we have to um, provide um, the, well, we have to um, give uh, one component has to give another component um, access to the resource so that we can um, utilize the resources more thoroughly. And last but not least, we want to have a system that scales well. When scalability means that we have uh, a variety of use cases of workloads, basically, that we all want to accommodate with one system. And we can achieve this by structuring the way in um, the system in a recursive way so that we can compose complex systems by using simple building blocks. Naturally, the GNOME OS architecture is such a system that uh, contains all those four key features. Um, a GNOME system is normally structured as a tree where each parent owns the component. Uh, or, or owns a child. Uh, and by owns, the ownership is defined as having the responsibility as well as the ultimate control over the uh, other component. Um, for example, um, the child has to provide the resources that are needed to create its child. But in return, it retains the um, control of the child. That means it can restrict the system view of the child, it could, um, can um, restrict the access to the resources of the surrounding system of the child, and obviously it can also control the lifetime of the child. Um, so since a child can also have children, you will end up with a system where we have a recursive system and um, um, each component in this system gets assigned, well, since I told you before, um, we don't want to abstract physical resources. In the GNOS architecture, we um, have a budget of physical resources. And this budget can be used to either uh, access the resource or you can uh, pass along the budget within the, uh, along the branches of the tree. So components can trade its budget. Um, this dynamically trading of budgets enables you to basically um, provide services without paying for them. Like for example, I have a frame buffer multiplexer, resource multiplexer that enables clients to display pictures on one frame buffer. 
um, instead of the uh, resource multiplexer um, having, to, uh, having to spend uh, its own resources, each component that wants to display uh, um, an image of the frame buffer will deno uh, donate some of its budget to the resource multiplexer. Um, and as I said, um, those trading mechanisms enable you, enable the system to, to really utilize the resources in a, in a proper way. Um, since we talk about application-specific uh, trusted computing base, if we look at the, at the figure, um, at the bottom we see the reddish box, which is basically our microkernel. The microkernel is part of every uh, TCB of every component in the system, um, but its only um, well, um, job is to provide for one, threads of execution, so you can run components. It has to provide protection domains so that all components that are run within the system are isolated from each other, and it uh, needs to provide a mechanism to, um, for the components to communicate with each other in a controlled way. All other system functionality like device drivers, file system, protocol stacks, runtime environments, or, um, or virtual machines, for example, um, um, security sensitive functions and so on are provided as component within the tree. They are not part of the, of the underlying microkernel and so you can um, structure your system in a way that it becomes easy for you to, to assess the trusted computing base of one specific component. Um, for example, if we look at the, at the yellow box, the yellow box has several parents and grandparents, and the red area denotes basically the trusted computing base. That means the, all components that the yellow box has to trust. Um, but if we look at the whole picture, we can just completely discard the, red, uh, the right side of the tree because the right side of the system is completely unrelated to the yellow box. Um, so that means, for example, we could run some huge complex web browser on the right side and we could run our GNU PG or whatever security crypto um, component on the left side and it isn't possible for, for the components to influence it, each other. Um, building on that, it makes sense that you um, locate critical components um, as near to the root of the tree as possible, because, well, in this case, the trusted computing base is small. Um, and, well, that enables you to, to build secure systems, complex systems, but you can manage the complexity in that you build a system uh, consisting of, of um, multiple smaller systems. And, well, the concrete implementation of the GNOME OS architecture is the GNOME OS framework. It's basically uh, a construction kit for special purposes OSs written in C++. Um, it scales from embedded systems to general purpose computing. That means it uh, runs on systems with uh, at least uh, four megabytes of memory available and well, obviously also on my, my laptop, which has, has much more resources. Um, since even the kernel is just one component of the system, we, the Genome REST framework runs on multiple kernels, and we are actually, uh, all components are binary compatible between the kernels, um, which is a nice feature because you can debug your component on Linux and later on deploy it on the target which runs a microkernel. Um, and um, one of the things is, um, the framework as a whole just provides the means that uh, components or can communicate in a controlled manner and can um, access resources in a controlled manner. And um, in the current implementation, in the concrete implementation of the GNOS framework, every program is executed in its isolated sandbox and um, can only communicate via um, a specific mechanism with the outside uh, are the surrounding components. Um, the OS framework consists of about now, by now about hundreds of, of ready-to-use components. 
since I already mentioned that, that all the system functionality that normally is located in the kernel is provided by components within the system, um, it well, would require much effort to write all those components from scratch. So for, therefore, we, we borrow basically the drivers from other operating systems. For example, our frame of our driver is ported from the Linux kernel for Intel graphic card, graphics cards. We also use the um, Intel wireless stack, uh, the Linux wireless stack, as well as the Intel wireless device drivers from Linux for our wireless driver. Um, the OpenBSD audio subsystem provides the foundation for our audio driver, and uh, we use NetBSD as the ROM kernel of NetBSD as file system provider. Um, so we we gather all, we collect all the functionality that we need to actually run the system from other open source projects which is quite nice, actually. Um, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel and, and implement the drivers on our own. Of course, Gnode.js framework is, is also open source. It's dual licensed. Uh, the open source license is the AGPL version 3, and there are also commercial license options available. Yeah, that's just a nice picture which uh, shows you some components. Um, on one side, the, in the middle, you see the various kernels the, the GeneDress framework runs on. The bluish boxes denote the, the uh, device drivers. Um, and actually, it isn't, well, it doesn't matter uh, the, which components you actually see here. It's just a rough overview. Uh, of course, there is documentation. Um, there is the book called Genote Foundations, which explains um, more thoroughly how the, the um, system came to be and, uh, and explains uh, the technical details uh, in, in depth. And uh, well, I encourage you to just take a look at the book because it's nice written and it's really worth your time to just read it. Okay, finally, I will talk about Sculpt. Um, yeah, um, by now, since I said um, the Genote OS framework was by now only used to build general purpose uh, systems, um, back in 2014, um, we said, well, it's about time that we use the system on a daily basis for doing our work. So we created the static Tomula scenario, which, which basically is um, a system which, where you can run dynamically, as, where you can change at runtime can change the components you run. For example, you can, can start multiple virtual machines, you can start your web browser, your, your POSIX environment, and so on. But it's static in the sense that it's still limited to integration time. That means if you want to exchange components or update components, you would still have to build your own system image and boot your system image. Fast forward four years. Static, uh, well, doesn't scale well, so we thought, well, we, we need a dynamic system, a system that is easily accessible and uh, changeable, well, shapeable actually at, at runtime. So we developed the, we built the uh, Sculpt uh, OS. Uh, Sculpt is short for, for sculpture, uh, basically, which, which denotes the, the intent the, the system has. And the first version we released in February, uh, that was the um, version Sculpt for the early adopters. Uh, in this version, you still had to you to build your, your own system image. Um, and uh, there was just a minimal POSIX shell for interacting with the system to, to do your administrative work, basically. Um, back in May, we released Skype for the Curious, um, which for the first time in years provided a ready-to-boot system image of Gnode, uh, which works on real machines as well as on virtual machines. And it also featured uh, um, a graphical user interface that aids the user by doing some administrative tasks. So we are not confined to just using the uh, POSIX shell. So let's look at the, how this system is structured. Well, you will see that it uh, reassembles the, the figure I have shown you before, in that it's uh, a tree, basically, and the tree hosts different subsystems, and each subsystem has a specific use case or um, uh, a purpose, basically. And, um, well, at the bottom, there is still your microkernel, and now we will 
briefly look to, into the uh, in each subsystem. Let's start with the static system. The static system hosts the part of the system that does not change at runtime. Uh, and, uh, for one, it uh, provides a uh, frame buffer resource multiplexer or nitpicker GUI server, as well as components that enable other components or subsystems basically to report its, uh, their state, to access um, boot modules, for example, like the, the, the ROM component, the ROM service enables you to, to load um, uh, elf binaries from the boot image. Um, as well as there are two file systems. One, the report F file system that um, provides a nice file-based view on each of the reports, as well as the config file system, which provides the storage location for each uh, for the configuration of each of the components. Um, and you have some global policy, well, which will I uh, go into more detail later. All right, so let's um, start with the first subsystem, the driver subsystem, actually. Um, the driver subsystem contains all the components that are needed to bootstrap the system, like your, your platform driver, your, your, use, your input driver, your frame buffer driver, your storage driver, and so on. Um, don't let be a, don't be intimidated by the by the figure. Um, that's the complexity you normally have also in your traditional OS sys, uh, kernel or system. But in contrast to the traditional system on Gnode, the complexity is hidden in plain sight. But luckily, you can also choose to ignore it. Uh, basically treat the driver subsystem as a black box, which transforms low-level resources like, for example, the I.O. memory, the I.O. ports, or interrupts uh, into higher-level resources like, for example, um, here the uh, platform um, resource, input resource, frame of resource, and so on. And the other subsystems can access these resources, but they don't care about the, the details, like they, they don't care that the device driver accesses I.O. memory. They just care about that the graphics driver provides a frame buffer service so they can paint something onto the screen. Um, oh, and... Uh, the next subsystem is the so-called light centrale, which is basically the German term for control center and is um, the subsystem that hosts the administrative um, interface. Um, in this case, there are, uh, on the right-hand side, you see a, a component which displays the system lock. And on the left-hand side, you see, well, since it's an old slide, normally it would be the, the sculpt manager that you see here. Um, but in a sense, you have one component that controls the system and the other component shows some system state. And I can actually show you that. For example, if I fade in the light centrale, on the right side, you see the system lock and on the left side, you see the sculpt manager. Um, the Skype Ninja itself is basically uh, also a subsystem. It uh, um, hosts various components. For one, there is one component, the system agent, basically, that uh, monitors the system state of the various driver components and uh, another component which provides the, um, the graphical view and also handles the user input. And yeah, that's basically your, your um, administrative interface if you interact with the Skype system. Yeah, as I said, um, the system is managed by the Skype manager component. Um, the managed configurations are stored within the config file system in the managed directory. There are some inbuilt heuristics. Um, for example, which default file system is used when the system boots up and, uh, and so on. But you can also choose to override all the, um, uh, the automatically managed configurations. And you can access the system via the inspect option of the graphical user interface. And we will exactly do that. So let me just show you what's in the config file system. Well, just to, to show you the system, as you have seen in the, in the uh, previous slides, this is basically your config file system and that's your report file system. 
we will go into the config file system and there we have uh, a bunch of files that control certain aspects of the system. Um, for example, oh, let me just show you the, the, the manage directory. Um, it well, contains the, the, the files of the uh, subsystems that, that are automatically managed from the Skype manager. But um, since I now use the system I normally use and not an uh, uh, empty system like I would like to do because well, the PDF viewer didn't work the way I wanted to, um, I will show you my, my, uh, my own config files. For example, uh, within the input filter config file, you can configure the input subsystem. And in the, uh, those files, you can, for example, um, add key remappings. Uh, I'm a, a vivid Vim user and, and I don't use my caps lock very much. So naturally, the first thing I do is remap the caps lock to the escape key because it's much more, much more comfortable to, to well, press it with my pinky finger. So. But what I can show you is if I go to the rate settings and I press A, you see the key is repeated very fast. If I change the setting and press A again, well, it takes somewhat longer. Um, another thing um, we have, as we have seen, the, con uh, the uh, framework for resource multiplexer is also part of the static system, but we can change the configuration of the frame buffer quite easily, the, the multiplexer. Here we have uh, different domains, and as you can see, there is one domain that basically just uh, hosts the, the pointer, uh, and another domain which uh, hosts the, the light centrale and so on. And what I can actually do is I can change the origin of one domain. For example, if I just change the origin of the light central domain to the, to the pointer, suddenly the light central follows my pointer movement because it's anchored to the pointer position. Um, and as I've said, uh, um, there is some global policy in the static system. And here you see the global key management. For example, um, when I open the input filter again, as you can see, certain uh, F keys are remapped to other keys. And those keys are used in the global policy to trigger events. For example, if I press F12, the light central will fade in and fade out. Uh, and that's basically how you can, can configure your system. All right, let's go back. Finally, let's look at the runtime subsystem. The runtime subsystem is actually the subsystem where the user runs its applications. For example, um, the virtual machines, the web browser, uh, the editor, uh, the POSIX subsystem, and so on. Um, it is also managed by the Skype manager, but it can also be controlled by the user. And namely, it can, the user can change the deploy configuration file. And well, yep, now I just closed the PDF view, but that's fine. Um, I'm actually already in my um, deploy configuration file, and you can see that there are uh, also already uh, an, a backdrop. So let me just close the component. No. Okay, so the backdrop is gone. Um, and what the user basically can do, the user can um, select the components, the programs he uh, wants to run by just editing the configuration file. And uh, well, what we can do, we can just spawn some nice, oh well, there's the backdrop back again. Um, just let me remove the backdrop once again because I just wanted to show you the, the uh, program which, which draws some uh, object. And we can edit the configuration file that is uh, used by the component to, well, in this case, 
we change the config file to use another painter for the configuration uh, for the component and now the, the component uh, well, uses another painter to paint itself. Um, let's start the backdrop again and the PDF viewer. So for now, what we have seen so far uh, is how I can well, start already installed um, components or programs for that matter. Um, what I now want to show you how you actually can install components on the Sculpt OS. To install software, well, we need first, we need a location where we can temporarily store the archives we are downloading. We need a location where we can store the installed software. Um, we need the source where we can download the archives from. And we need a public key to verify that the archives we have downloaded are actually properly um, signed and, and, and not tampered with. Um, so it's well, your, your basic uh, package manager workflow. You, um, in five steps, you install the software. Um, what's noteworthy here is that on Gnode, or on, on Skype for that matter, it's uh, also a subsystem which is orchestrated by the download manager. And the way it works is that we first look for all the missing dependencies. We um, look, uh, look up the information we need to find the source of the missing dependencies. Um, we fetch the missing dependencies, we verify them, and we extract them. But what is normally done in one program on traditional systems is done in Gnode this, um, in multiple components or programs, basically. Uh, as I said, the download manager controls the subsystem. And at first, it will start the depot query component that will look up the missing dependencies. It will therefore uh, look into the um, file system when normally the um, software is installed in. That's basically the depot uh, directory. Um, it will then look up the missing information, uh, with also, which is also stored in the depot directory. Um, afterwards, it will replace the query component with the fetch URL component, give the component access to the network and write access to the uh, location where the archives are temporarily stored. But it can't access the um, directory where the um, software is installed, so it can't tamper with already installed software. Um, even if there is some bug or somebody exploits the, the component. After we have downloaded the file, well, we will uh, replace the FedRL program with, with the Verify program and um, we will cut our network connection and we will give the Verify component only read only access to the archives that were just downloaded. And after the Verify component uh, has verified that the archives are actually sound, um, the download manager will start the extract program which will extract the archives and uh, write them to the uh, proper location. Um, so, in a sense, the installation and deployment is synonym on, on Sculpt. The depot is just a cache that uh, holds um, the files. Um, I can actually show you how that looks. For example, if I move into the my, my storage device, and there is the depot directory, and there you see uh, multiple um, directories. For example, in my directory, you will find uh, the download file, which contains the address where the archives are downloaded from, and my public key. Um, and there you also see all the, well, let's just do the recursive thing. Um, you also you always see that that the um, all packets are um, versioned, so you can install multiple versions. And in case a newer version has some missing feature or has some some bugs or something like that, you can um, roll back to an older version by just choosing to to run the older version in your configuration file. And well, it's a user-defined policy. That means that there is no automatism that updates something or, or 
tries to run a, a program without the consent of the user. Um, we will just skip that part and we'll come to the roadmap for this year. Um, well, by now we have some, some iterative process where with each Skype version we introduce new features and the next version, which will be released in a few days, uh, will contain um, some visual composition feature. I can tease it some a little bit because here you can see uh, some components that are already running in the... Well, let me make that a little bit more clear. Um, right. Oh. Um, here you see some components that are running in the runtime environment and if I click on such a component it will show me how much resources it's currently using and um, yeah by well we, we hope that at some point um, the need to open the shell to interact with the system is uh, well reduced to a bare minimum, um, but well, the, the graph is the, the key feature in the uh, Scoop VC release at the end of August. And well, you, you already can download the system, you can build packages, you can publish packages, but so far the tooling is somewhat lacking for, for uh, a community to foster around the Skype system. And that we hope to address, uh, address by the, the end of the year with our um, release in November. Uh, well, more details you can find on the roadmap. Um, and yeah, so far that is it for, for my part. I, I hope I don't have rushed too much. Oh, it's actually fine. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time. And if you have questions, please ask them. Yes. No, no, no. Um, ah, it's, it's good. Uh, the, the question was if if multiple or two components want to communicate with each other, if they have to traverse the key ba uh, the tree basically every time back to the the, the root of the tree. Um, no, you, uh, they don't. Um, they have to initially because the parent provides access to the the grandparent and the other components. But after you have established the connection, basically you exchange the capabilities. Uh, both components can communicate directly with each other. So you, you might have some, if that was your, your intention, you have some latency when you, um, when you first request the service because obviously you have to traverse the tree, but later on, it, well, you can basically communicate without any latency. All right. Another question? All right, thank you for your time. <laughs> <laughs>